Charlavan Horn, Black Expats in Panama, by way of Little Low Glassville, New Jersey. You know it, right here on BlackTipRadio.com. And I am here today with the amazing Stephanie Perry. I am so excited to have you with us today, um, Stephanie. You, you, you have no idea how proud I am of you and how some people may not engage a lot, but so many people are rooting you on. I mean, honestly, you to me, and I wanna, I'm going to let you introduce yourself, but you're familiar with Tabitha Brown. Absolutely. Absolutely. You to, you to me are like a Tabitha Brown, a Tabitha Brown uh, type. Mm -hmm. And it's like, for me, the Tabitha Brown is anybody that hates on Tabitha Brown got a problem because yeah. Tabitha Brown is just like so lovable. And that's how I see you. So welcome to the show. Um, please introduce yourself to those who may not have met you and say hi to all those who have. Thank you so much, Charlotte. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for, for having me on. I'm so excited. Mm -hmm. And hello, everybody. My name is Stephanie Perry. I'm a house sitter. Uh, I'm a, a full-time traveler. I am a woman who helps other Black women make decisions for themselves to take a career break or live abroad or travel full time or become a house sitter. Uh, and we do these things while embracing ease. I believe in doing as little as possible. Uh, so I'm really excited to be here to talk with you and to meet everybody in your audience today. Well, that's exciting. What, what do you call it? Do you call it a soft life? Is that what you call it? I call it embracing ease. But I'm down with soft life. I think a lot of people, a lot of times the soft life gets mixed up with luxury life. Okay. And for a lot of people, that luxury life is not soft, right? It's not easy. It includes yeah. going to a job that is toxic and destroying you. So yeah. I like to say embracing ease. Thank yeah. you so much. And thank you for your kind words. I appreciate uh, the Tabitha the Brown comparison. That's big. <laughs> I mean I'll that. I it. mean that sincerely. You, you will have. Not, I think I've said that to anyone else. Um, but you know, so tell, tell me, where are, where are you from? Like, okay, I know that you, you came from a pharmaceutical background, right? Uh -huh. Um, tell me, tell me your story. That's a little bit about where you're from and what led up to all of what you're doing. Well, Ms. Glassboro, New Jersey. I'm from <laughs> exotic Dover, Delaware. Neighbor. <laughs> Uh, I'm from Delaware. I worked in a hospital pharmacy and I worked night shift. Uh, that job had a lot of say over where I could travel, what I could, when I could take vacations, how long I could take vacations. So that was my origin story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Working night shift in a hospital pharmacy is what, what created the person I am today who can't stand jobs. Absolutely. But I'm from Delaware. I've been, I've lived in Ohio, in Columbus, Ohio, in my childhood years. And uh, when I was in the army, I was stationed in Texas about a hundred years ago. What part of Texas? Fort Hood, Texas, Colleen, Texas. Oh, Colleen. Yeah. Okay. I lived in Lubbock for a minute. Oh, okay. Yeah. My husband was at um, Reese, I think it was. We've been following each other around the world. Didn't even know it. Look, here we go. I got to get you back to Panama. When you came, when you came to Panama, I was in Egypt. I was so sorry oh. that I missed you. So, okay. So you, you grew up in, in Dover, Delaware. Yeah. Wow. Know. Okay. And so then you decided, you decided early on that this whole, somebody tell me when and where I could go and what I can do and, you know, is not, is not for you. Mm -hmm. So what did you do next? How did you decide to pivot from that? It started with just a career break. It started with me saying, I'm going to take one year for me. Mm -hmm. I had, up until that point, I had been living my whole life as if I need to just get to 65. Or maybe 67. I need to get to retirement age and then I get to live for me. 
And then one day I was like, no, I'll take mine now, right? Let's do a mini retirement. Let's do a sabbatical. So I was 41 in 2015 and I took one year. I traveled Southeast Asia and Australia, a little bit of Europe. Um, and that was the beginning. That was me saying, I don't, don't want to do things the way that I've been told. I don't want to wait until retirement age. I think I would sincerely believe that waiting until your retirement age to start living, it's a scam, right? I want to do things while my body is mostly on my side. <laughs> I want to do yes. things. I, I feel like doing them. Uh, and so it would, I was like, it, how could it be um, robbery for me to take just one year out of my working life? For you. Right. Just one. That's yeah. all I'm asking for. One year where I get all of the say. I thought I was going to go back to work the that way. Right. I thought I was going to go back to work and then just maybe do it again and then wait till 65. I didn't know that that was going to start the avalanche. <laughs> I didn't know that was going to change my whole life. So you did 12. Now, if I'm right, did you do 12 countries in 12 months? Is that what you did? That's what I did. 12 countries, 12 months, $1,200 a month. Cause I was a pharmacy technician. I didn't have a lot of money. So that's what I did. Uh, mostly Southeast Asia, because once you get to a region, you know, once you get to uh -huh. a region, it's easy to go from place to place inside of the region. The expensive part of travel is getting to that region uh -huh, or going from region to region. So like if you, if I wanted to go from Thailand to P Panama, yeah. that's going to cost big bucks, but yeah. Thailand to Cambodia is, is dollars, it's pennies, you know? Yes, that, that's very interesting. And it's always a good point to make because I want people to always be fit. Cause I'm not that smart geographically. I'll just tell you to your face. Okay. okay? If okay. you start talking about places, I'll be like, yeah, girl. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. I'm a, look, and I make a note, look that up. Um, yes. <laughs> look that up. But what I do know is that even for me being in Panama, you know, it is so easy to hop over to Colombia, Costa Rica, Ecuador, and things like that. And so having people be aware that when you're at in a particular place, what's close by that you can take advantage of being able to see yet another country for like, you know, very little bit of money. And That's I just right. want to touch on one more thing that you said. Yeah. And you started talking about 65 and 67. Girl, it's a scam. You're right. It's a scam. It, it is a scam. And as I walked into my other room, because, you know, we're in a hot place and we have individual units. And I walked into this, this other room and I went from the warm hallway to the cool room. This just happened to me. And I thought, condition, air condition, oh. air condition. And I said, you know, anything that conditions us, we have to be careful of. Okay. <laughs> because growing up in New Jersey, we never had an air conditioner. I had right. never had an air conditioner in my air conditioner in my house. Now it's like I can't imagine not having one. I can't uh -huh. imagine having cars, you know, when I was younger right. without air conditioning. So we've been conditioned to think that we're supposed to work all our daggone life. We have been. We have been. And when you go to these other countries that America is telling you it's better than, mm -hmm. you see other people who get to live a full life where life is, where work is not the boss of them. You go to these other countries and people, whole families are sitting out, sitting down to the dinner table at nine o'clock at night at a restaurant. The grandma, the parents, the kids, the grandkids, you got generations of people spending time together on a random Tuesday, random Tuesday evening. You're right. We're we're really told that here in this, in the, nah, we're, neither one of us are in the, well, I'm kind Thank of God. in the United Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit right, right now. There in the United States, yeah. we really are taught from the very beginning that work is supposed to be the center. Even school, like school, when you're a kid, you get praised for not missing school. Is the, They're just training you mm -hmm. to make work the most important thing in your life. Uh, and when I got out, and I got to see other people who didn't live like that yeah. and were just as, you know, just had just as much going on in their lives or more, had better lives than me. Yeah. I could go back. There was no turning back. It's the conditioning. It's the conditioning. My husband is from yes. Panama and that's how I ended up here. And I can remember, like I said, I'm, I'm not good at geography. I remember meeting him in 1993 and he said, I, I said, where are you from? He said, Panama. I said, I don't know. <laughs> Listen, I didn't even know what pattern I was, okay? Um, but <laughs> when I when I met him, 
he said to me, he said, I'm going back to Panama when I retire. And I said, oh, it's nice. You know, because one, I'm thinking, I'm not going to know you then. I mean, this was 30 years ago. But of course, when we first met, okay. I'm like, you know, probably a few dates and you know. And okay. first of all, I didn't think I would know him then. And then the other thing was, I was like, why would anyone want to leave the United States? Right. That's where I was. I'm not even, I ain't even thinking the fuck, baby. They had me completely convinced. Your girl yes. didn't even have a damn passport. That's right. <laughs> Why do I need one? And then back then, I think you could take cruises with your birth certificate. It just wasn't mm-hmm. required, required mm-hmm. for everything that you do. But it's the conditioning. Mm-hmm. That's right. Propaganda. The United States is really good. We, The United States will tell you it's really good at a lot of things. But what it's really good at is propaganda. It's not good at those other things. It's not good at health care. It's not good at education. It's not good at city planning. It's not good at any of the lifestyle stuff that we really want for ourselves. Yes. What is good at is propaganda. It's good at telling you it's good. They're the best. It's telling you that they're the best. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, um, as far as that conditioning goes, also, that's what the master tell the slaves. Like, right. don't you leave this plantation. Because if you, you go it. out there, Mr. Charlie and them going to treat you worse. I treat you better than they could ever treat you. And right. you start... You know, I think that more of us are really starting to catch on to that. And it could be problematic for the United States. And then the other thing that you talked about was that whole 65, 67. And I heard Nikki Haley say the other day, well, yeah, you know, we have to increase the Social Security retirement age uh, to go with the life expectancy. And this brother did a video. He was like, what did you say? He said, are you really just telling us we need to work till we die? (laughs) That's what they're the telling us. The whole thing, Stephanie, the whole thing about this middle age thing. You know, you've been hearing about midlife crisis and middle age this and middle age that forever. And it's always associated with people around 50. You know, who the hell lives to be 100? Not most of us. I don't know. So I'm 49 and I've decided that I'm going to live to be about 120. And so I need to start acting like it. Listen, so uh, when I'm 49 and when I was a kid, when you turned 100, you got on the national news. Yes. Willard yes. Scott would put you on the national news. Now everybody's family has 100 year olds. Like yes. big deal. So is my grandma, right? <laughs> but most of, most of the people, the average person does not live that long. You know, I mean, how many people are, you know, leaving here at 60 and 70 and, you know, I mean, good, good thing is 90. But yeah. just to say that midlife for most of us is 50, I think uh-huh. is, is a farce. Yeah. Um, I think that for a lot of us, midlife is between 35 and 40. Yeah. Yeah. We need to take a hold of our lives because yeah. no nothing is guaranteed. Right. In that statistic that says your average life expectancy is 76, there are people who are dying at your age. Right. We we have to put make sure that we're living our lives and not postponing. I went on vacation with my parents right after my mom retired. My dad retired pretty young. My dad retired in his mid 50s, but my mom retired at 65. I think she might have been 66. And we went on vacation and I was like, this ain't it. Right. She was moving around pretty good. But, you know, her hip. And his oh, knee and all okay, that. And I'm like, okay. no, no, I don't want to do it like that. You know, I don't me want to neither. Do me neither, um, Stephanie. I don't. So you started traveling to, you started out with Southeast Asia, you said. Did you say uh, Southeast yeah. Asia? And then how did you end up? Because now you're more like in the, um, you you like Costa Rica, right? You like Costa Rica, mm-hmm. Mexico. You like Portugal? That's right. Yeah. So after I came back from that year of travel, I spent up all my money, came back and I was like, okay, but I'm not ready to go back now. You know, I'm not ready to go back to this life. I want to keep traveling. That was mid, uh, that was September, 2016. So I Googled how to travel with no money. And Google was like, you should be a house sitter. So I started house sitting and that took me to places that I hadn't been before, like Mexico, even though Mexico is our neighbor, I hadn't been to Mexico yet and Costa Rica and uh, Latin America is just awesome. It's just amazing, yes. you know. <laughs> it, is. it really does. It just it just feels so good. I love I love Panama too. So that's how you ended up um, back in Latin Latin America. 
That's right. And so then did you, so you had, when you left your job, had you resigned or just taken a, a leave of absence or? I quit. I resigned. They didn't have any policy that would let me pause my employment there. So I just quit. When I came back with no money and was like Google and how to keep traveling, uh, I, they actually hired me back. I got my, I got offered my old job back. It was easy. Uh Um, I got offered that job back and I got offered a job at a different hospital that was actually closer to where my parents lived. And um, it was really easy to do. So the employee employers didn't hold a grudge. They were really, um, they kind of admired the fact that I yeah. took some time and traveled and was ready to come back to work, they thought. But I worked for three months and I was like, I can't. I can't. Go back. What it's else hard. was out there? It's hard. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I left um, corporate America in 2017 for good. Mm. And um, I just can't imagine ever, ever doing that. Um, you know, I think that a lot of, when you say that they were, they were gracious to you. And I think it's probably because secretly, they all like envied you like, damn, I wish I could do that. You know, I wish I was brave enough to do it, but you don't have any children. That's one thing, right? You don't have children. No, that's right. It's just me. And so I get to make a lot of decisions and take some risks. Uh, Although people with children are living like this as well. They are. They are. However, I think that not having children or just, I mean, and actually too, not being married Mm -hmm. and not, not, not having to answer to anyone is like the best case scenario, you know? So that's why a lot of grandparents are moving now because their kids are grown and, you know, the kids yeah. are trying to get us to stay because the grandkids are like, girl, I stayed for you, you know, and my kids didn't do that, but I'm just saying, um, but you get out here and you start to carve your life for yourself. So where was the first place that you have set? Okay. I love technology. I don't care if it gets crazy. Sometimes we get to be together and that's what's up. Um, so like there are certain times in your life when it's, it's easier. People are doing it with kids these days. I think that, you know, COVID and the whole like, Oh, we got this digital situation over here. You know, this working virtually, um, really opened up the door for a lot of other people to take those courageous moves like you did as well. That's right. That's right. Um, this used to be like bopping around, being a nomad or moving abroad used to be only for a certain per- type of person, a person who just had a stash of cash somewhere, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Or a person who was lucky enough to have a job that moved them abroad or something. But now it's opened up for a lot of more, a lot of different people, more people. Yeah. yeah. And it's, and it's, uh, it's so good to see. I mean, Panama is very, very popular for retirement. Uh huh. Like great pensionado visa, and you know the weather, the proximity to um, you know the United States, especially very close to Florida and things like that. And so, it for quite a while had been just a lot of seniors and people retiring early. That's something we really need to talk about because people are like, you know what? Mm, I think uh, like I think I'm finna run. <laughs> I got what I came for, right? I got I got what I came for. I'm a I'm ahead of <laughs> But now, but now also the thing is is that they're they're making these moves. Younger people are starting to come now too because they can work remotely. Um there's a lot of really good schools here. And yep. so pe- more people are starting to make those moves and I think that I'm glad to do it. I'm glad to see it. And I'll say one more thing. I think that you have played a big part in that. You have. So you have played a big part in that. Almost anybody that is dealing with Black Sid or Black people moving abroad know your name. That's it. And even if they have to say, what's that girl's name? And you say, uh-huh. Steffi, yeah, that's her, that's her. So I, I applaud you for not only taking that journey for yourself, but sharing it with the world. So you started doing, you started, you looked up house sitting and Mexico was your first stop. Mexico was my first international house sit. I did a couple of test house sits in the U.S., one right in Delaware, really close to where I was living. Uh, But, and one went to Boston and Delaware first, I think. But my first international house sit was to Mexico. Uh, It was a Canadian family. A lot of people who are, get how a lot of people who know about house sitting right now are American, Canadian, British, Australian, right? And so as they move to a place, they introduce house-sitting to that place. Okay. 
I, uh, yeah, I got to house it for a Canadian family in Mexico. It was my first time in Mexico. And I was like, this is nice. People are so good to me here. Genuinely good. I've been places where people are nice to me because I'm an American tourist and I have U.S. dollars and, you know, they like that. They were people worship U.S. dollars all over the world. So I've been to places where that was the case, but being in Latin America was the first time, one of the first times where I was like, oh, these are just good people, right? Yes, <laughs> they're, yes. they're just being good to me because they're good people. They have a strong sense of community and they, and, and while I'm in that community, I'm part of that community and we all have a responsibility to each other, each other. including them to me. Uh, so that was the first, my first house sit in Mexico. I was there for like a one month house sit. I ended up staying for six months and just, you know, living my life. <laughs> so, I mean, pe- people are saying like, I mean, it's just amazing. That's that's an amazing story. But so people are saying, okay, so you look, you Googled it. And then what did you do? Did you, you Google to find out what is the going rates, you know, how to go about setting yourself up to be a house sitter and then just took that advice and put yourself out there. How did you connect with that first family? I do it the easiest way possible. So there's a platform <laughs> called Trusted House Sitters ah. and I find up on the platform. It's like an Airbnb for house sitting, right? People who need a house sit and people who have a house sit uh, meet each other on that site. So I just signed up for trusted house sitters. Now, as an American person who is from Delaware, which is is black, right? Delaware is more is blacker than people think it is. Uh-huh. Um, <laughs> lived in Ohio in in the suburbs outside of Columbus, Ohio. I was very leery of signing up for house sitting as a black person. I was like, it's not going to work, right? These white people aren't going to book me, or it's just not going to work. Yeah. Um, and so that was that kept in the back of my mind that kept me, even though I had already paid for my membership that kept me from applying for house sits, but somebody reached out to me and it worked out and no turning back. So that's why I talk so much about house sitting because black American people need some extra assurances that things are going, that they're going to be treated well, um, that things are going to work. You know, we can't just go in. We don't just walk into things and assume that people are going to be on our side. We have to be, you know, we need somebody talking that talk. So that's why I started talking house sitting on my channel and uh, wherever, anywhere people will let me talk about it because it means I get free accommodation anywhere, free accommodation anywhere in the world. Uh, It's opened up so many new new, new places to me and helped me meet some new friends in these places. It really, house sitting has given me the world. Not not a lot of cash, but free accommodation is just like cash. It's the it same. is, it is. Yeah. It, it definitely is. It is like a, a perk or benefits. It's like, you know, when you take a job, when you take a job, you know, you're going to get your base pay and then, but you're also going to always have to consider the perks. That's right. <laughs> that benefits package. That's right. Yeah. And That's I think right. that, and I think that when you went into this, you went into it, with a perspective that a lot of us haven't been introduced to. And Mm. that is, what do I want my life to look like for myself? That's right. What do I want? What do I want my life to look like for myself? Mm. And I think that we have been conditioned to think that our life really begins at retirement. Yeah. And that's just not the case. No, no. No. Yeah. We need, we, we have to live our every day. Every day, hopefully every day, every year of our lives, we get to live what the life that we want or what was the point, right? If you, if you're holding off for retirement to live your life, then you're saying that this, that your life, that you are a worker and that you were put here to work. Mm -hmm. And I think as in particular, as black people, that's a harmful, um, uh, result of slavery. That's all fruit of the slavery tree. The whole idea that we're supposed to be so focused on work and we're not really supposed to have a whole life. Right. It, what is what? There's not a whole lot of difference. Mm-hmm. And so we have to choose. We, we Hopefully, I hope that all Black people can take some time and really examine what parts of their lives they're choosing mm-hmm. and what parts of our lives we've just been handed. Yeah. And reject some of that stuff that you were handed. Put it down. Put it. You don't have to keep carrying the stuff. Just because somebody hands you something doesn't mean you need to take it and carry it forever. So what have you learned about yourself? 
so much. So I got to meet myself. I took that career break when I was 41. And I, so many things I thought about myself were not true. They were just, uh, I interviewed a woman on my own, on my, on my channel a while ago, 2019. And she said this, and I haven't been able to stop thinking about it. JC said, I realized how much of myself was just a result of having to live in the environment that I was in. And once I got out of that environment, I didn't have to be that person. And that's me, right? So I I thought I was a person who didn't, believe it or not, I used to think I didn't like talking to strangers. Really? And now all I do is talk to strangers. <laughs> I was not a people person, I thought. I thought I wasn't a people person. I didn't like to talk to strangers. I also thought that people didn't particularly like me all that much, right? I lived, I know, I lived in a place, I, living in the white suburbs of Ohio was not a good, not for my childhood brain. It didn't do me any favors. Right. And, a, and I kept all that stuff. And here I am 41, still thinking that until I go out to the world without the my, daily microaggressions, the same, not without those same microaggressions, without the overt racism yes. that's, you know, that we see in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And I realized that, oh, actually, I really like talking to strangers. Mm -hmm. Actually, I am a people person. Actually, people do seem to like me as well. We have I to protect do. ourselves. I mean, it's oh. like when we're in the when we're in the U.S. and the 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 way that things are there for us, you mm -hmm. always you're on your guard. Always, you know, you're always you're always on your guard. Um, just like you know these videos that come out and you see you know white people all up in the cops' face and stuff, and you just think to yourself, "Wow, what that must be like." <laughs> <laughs> I think what the same thing. Like to live through something like that. Wow. To, what is it like to get to that age and, and still believe that everything is going to work out in your favor? Everybody is on your yes. side, no matter how wrong you are. Yes. Every system is designed for you to win. Everyone is on your side and you're always going to get the, the, the benefit of the doubt. Always. always. That's, that's, that, that's just, that's just, that's just the way that they think. I just see yeah. like living outside of the United States as like being a part of a dysfunctional family. Yeah. You know, some people are in what they call dysfunctional families and they don't even know they're in a dysfunctional family until they get outside and they see how other people live. That's right. Um, you brought up the point about being in Latin America and how they view, not that they're not hard workers, but they're very committed to family values. They're very committed to family values, family relationships, you know, okay, uh, I'm not good at that. I'm not good at familial ties. I'm just not. Okay. Um, I am just, I, and it's probably conditioning on my part too. I'm just the kind of person that I don't care who your mom is. I don't yeah. care who your dad is. If you can't treat me right, baby, I just can't, <laughs> I can't fool with you. You know, I'm never going to wish no bad on you, but I can't yeah. fool with you. Yes. You choose, right? So you choose who your circle is. It's yeah. not just, it's not because of blood. Yeah. It's not because of blood, but you know what? The doctors, the lawyers, I had to get used to this. The doctors, the lawyers, these like professions that typically in the United States have no time for their family. And everybody is just supposed to understand, Hey, listen, I'm trying to make partner. <laughs> No, I ain't got no time for you. You need to stay home, take care of these kids while I make partner. You know, and then once you make partner, then you really ain't got no time for your family. And then once you, once you start getting older and your kids have gone to school and, you know, somebody else have raised them and you have like strange and you have strange and distant relationships, but now you got a little time and you want to be somebody's mama or papa and the kids are like, I thought you. I don't, don't know me. you. I don't know you. <laughs> I don't know you. But here, girl, look. That's right. I have found an amazing Afro Panamanian doctor who um, serves all of our clients and comes on our tours and introduces himself and everything. I love him. But we have this. We introduce professionals on the first night of our tour, right? Doctor Duncan, listen. It has been very clear to me, or made very clear to me from the very beginning. Friday night, I'm on a date with my wife. Girl, don't ask. You know what I'm saying? And I and I said, well, I hear you. That's right. Friday night is he is not available because he will be with his girl. That's right. That's right. 
uh, they people get to live a whole life. They really don't see themselves as that job. That that that's not their whole being. Yes, they are a whole person. They have a whole family. They got hobbies. They have interests. They belong to sports teams. The soccer they coach soccer, right? They have. They get to live a whole life, they and they show, they show they show you life. once you move there. They show you how to do it. Because sometimes people move to places like that, but they still want to operate in the American way. And the people are like, no, we don't do that here. Okay. (laughs) And you're either going to get with it or you're not, you know? And I think that people, there are some things you just recognize. Like, for example, I did like a quick tip video the other recently. And it was like, when you're communicating with Panamanians, you need to ask them how they are, baby. Let me tell okay. you, every single time, I don't care if it's, I just noticed this. Yeah. I don't care if it's a personal communication, if it's a business communication. It's always, you know, hola, hello, how uh, are you doing? That's because right. they will definitely come back and tell you they're doing fine, even though you haven't even asked. <laughs> so noticing <laughs> those kinds of things. Uh, my husband's family is Panamanian. Um I am, I think that they have taught us in the U.S. to be more individualized. Right. We we definitely are more individualized. And so I think that me and my family have made, we have a happy, we have a happy medium. You know, I'm just not the one you roll up on. Okay. I'm never going to be that person. I don't (laughs) care where I am. I don't think that will ever change about me. Do not (laughs) roll up on me because that's not what, that's not what we're doing. However, comma, I'm going to respect the fact that y'all going to be together a lot. You know what I'm saying? And I'm going to be there and I'm going to be a part of the family and you, you are, everybody can come over here when it's time to come over here or whatever. Just don't roll up on me. Yes. Okay. (laughs) The Costa Ricans are like that too, with the, you have to say, how are you? Mm -hmm. I thought saying buenos dias or good afternoon or good evening or something in the text or in the WhatsApp message was enough. Right. I don't just get down to business. I at least say good afternoon. Yeah. But they're like, hello, Stephanie. How are you? Oh, you. Know, I'm like, I'm sorry. You know, too. They, got, they got me together. You know, got me together. Too. well, and then the other thing. So, OK, so you got out there. I think your story is amazing. Thank you got out there. You started doing this. You did your first house sit in Mexico. Tell me when you went for this house sit. What did they want you to do? Did they have pets? What was the, what is the main thing that people usually ask for? Almost all house sits through the trusted house sitters platform that I'm on are pet sits. There are people who, who book house sitters who don't have pets. Uh, Sometimes people who just have multiple properties, sometimes people in the, sometimes realtors, right? I've never done those kind of houses. Most of the houses that I've done are pet sits. What they wanted me to do is, is walk the dogs feed the dogs, mm-hmm. make sure the dogs you know, felt loved and not like they had been abandoned. Yes. And uh, take out the trash, right? Let the housekeeper in because when people go on vacation, they don't fire their housekeeper, right? Housekeeper still comes. Yes. Right. Let the housekeeper in so she could do her thing. Um, and that's it, right? Live in the house, make sure the house looks lived in and not mm-hmm. like they're gone, but that's it. We're talking, you know, two hours a day of actual activity and the rest of the time I'm in the pool. Okay. You catch me in the swimming pool. That's right. Or whatever. And so the good thing, it sounds like if you go through a service, they I'm sure do the vetting, the vetting of you, the vetting of the owner. So that's a plus because you know, you people would need to know that you don't need to just be trusting anybody to go to their daggone house. And then I'm sure that the animals have to be approved as well. But, you know, I was thinking that one way to really maybe promote that in Panama would be um, your house will mold, baby. If you're gone here, like we didn't live in this house. We built our house in 2012. We did not move in. My husband moved in here 2018 when he retired. And then I came after COVID more permanently in 2021. So for all those years initially, we didn't rent the house out, you know, because we would just come back and do a little stuff. One. But let me tell you something. I had to have somebody come in here at least once a month to clean it, mm-hmm. to clean it, to open the windows, to let it air out. You know, it is so easy in this climate to come back home to your house and have a mold situation. 
Okay. You need to keep, and then you don't want to just leave your air condition or air conditioners on forever. You don't no. want to do that because no. having air conditioning here in Panama is not inexpensive. That's right. You know, it is not inexpensive, and people need to consider that too when they're when they're even just making a move. But yeah, mm-hmm. just having somebody being in your house. Mm-hmm. That's good. Thing. Yeah, that's a good idea. A good idea for people. Yeah. So house sitting is kind of new. I think we're, it's not new, but like the idea, like house sitting is not mainstream yet. People don't just automatically say, oh, let me house it. Like when you go places nowadays, people are like, oh no, I can just Uber, right? Uber has crossed into the mainstream. Yeah. Yeah. House sitting hasn't done that yet, but you're right. That's a good way to, for house sitting to be like, to spread in Panama is to let people know you can have someone actually living in your house. Yes. Just a little bit of money. It only costs you whatever a membership costs you for the year. Right. And that will keep you from having whatever problem you could possibly have, whether it's mold mm-hmm. or whatever. Yeah. And if something's happening, somebody is there to, you know, recognize it. Because even if the with the house cleaners, um, you know, the, the, the staff come in to clean up. I mean, if they're coming in, if their regular schedule is every other week, I mean, mm-hmm. do they really come in every other week when you're not there? Or yeah. people know people want to say same schedule if the house is just empty. Yeah. And they're not investigating stuff. They're not like looking to exactly. see it. Exactly. 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 Yeah. So once you once you got hooked up on that, you did your you did your Mexico. And then yeah. what was the next place that you went to? Uh I think next I went to I did a lot of house sitting in Mexico. I think next I went to the UK and uh the Netherlands. Wow. So when you have sit, all you have to do is get there. Like they wouldn't like your airfare and everything. You do that. I cover my own airfare. I I did have one time when they had like it, they had to leave on an emergency and they covered my airfare. But generally I cover my airfare. You cover your food while you're there, right? Yeah. You're getting the free accommodation. Yeah. So I house that in uh, London, which is wonderful because London is expensive. Right. Yeah. <laughs> And I got a beautiful house sit in right outside of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. And it was April and flowers were in bloom. This was the first time I really realized that flowers grew on a farm. I'm from Delaware. I know farms, right? Uh-huh, I, uh-huh. I'm Hornet. from the real garden state. I know farms too. <laughs> you are, right? But for some reason, it just didn't occur to me that flowers grew on farms. I thought they all grew in greenhouses. You know, people who yeah. sold flowers. I thought they were all covered up, but you ride by just like in Delaware, you ride by the cornfields in the Netherlands, you ride by tulip fields. And wow, high fields. how and pretty that must be. It was so beautiful. I, I, let me tell you, wow. I took some pictures. Okay. I got, I got wow. stomped all over them flowers in my little dress taking photos. <laughs> <laughs> so have you counted the countries you've been to? I've been, to, No. I know I've been to uh, 30 something countries, but I don't know exactly. Wow. That's yeah. awesome. And and you it, it's it's the life that you've chosen for yourself. So now another thing about being in the United States, when I talk about dysfunction, when I talk about hurt people, um, you know, I just think that I got addicted to feeling at peace. Right. I got addicted to feeling peaceful, to right. Feeling like, I mean, I sometimes I get emotional thinking about how I feel when I'm here. Yeah. And the thought of going back to the States is always, it's nothing I really look forward to right now. It's hard. It is. It's hard. It's, I think if for some people it would sound kind of melodramatic, but you have to prepare yourself when you've been out of the U.S. for a little yes. while. Mm-hmm. You have to prepare yourself to go back. You have to prepare. It's like, it's, cause you know, as soon as you hit the, um, got the people, the, uh, the passport control, as soon as you hit them, you're back, you right? You, you, you you've got to put on some of those old protections, that old yes. armor, pull it out, put it back on, put on those, that shield. Uh, it's, yes. it's, it's really hard. I know people think like, whatever you, for, uh, you, yeah, from I, here. I think people are starting to wonder about what we're saying now though, because of course, you know, the internet, you know, it, it definitely has its issues. Yeah. However, comma, we are exposed to the world now. The internet has exposed us to the world and anybody can hop on YouTube and share their experience. 
And when they are, when people start seeing people that who have never seen you or known about you, you know, or me, you know, and they see us on there say, yeah, well, it's great out here. And, you know, you're, you're doing your thing, you know, as a house, as a house sitter, you know, I have just become a, a, a licensed tour operator here in Panama. Mm-hmm. So now we're like independent, we're doing our tours and we've just made some lives that we've chosen for ourselves. Yeah. And and I feel like when some people come to places, it's almost like a hurt people, hurt people thing. Uh, and you gotta you gotta get them together. Like, no, don't don't come here treating people like you didn't want to be treated in the US. That's right. You know, you, gotta, you, you have you that gotta. sometimes. Yeah, I, I have, I've uh, seen Ashley in Africa. Ashley is a woman who from Atlanta who moved to Tanzania and then South uh-huh. Africa. She said, please heal before you come to South Africa. Okay, yes. don't bring it with you. You really yes. do. Yes. But I guess it's hard. I don't know how people know what they need to heal from if they haven't really been able to see the other side yet. So yes. I guess it's really complicated and we just have to keep calling that out, right? Here's yes. the thing that you're doing <laughs> that, yes. that is a part of that old life. Don't let that be part of your new life. I think to advise people to be observant, to be mm. observant. How how are other people um, handling things? For example, right. um, for right. me, I come from, uh, you know, I, I hail from the United States of America. I am very aware of racism, very much aware. And quite frankly, I love it when you talked about overt racism and you qualified the racism experience that you were talking about because people like to say, oh, y'all act like they ain't no racism, you know, in other places. Or some people actually talk about these countries that they're in as if there is no racism. Well, that is just not true. It no. is. And then it's racism and then there's classism and then there's colorism. And so all of these things, you know, kind of exist. However, comma, what I had to commit to, Stephanie, was checking myself. Mm-hmm. I had to check myself. And it's like when stuff ain't going right, the first thing I think was, what, what? <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I'm uh-huh. thinking that it's a racism thing. Only uh-huh. reason she treated me like this because I'm black. <laughs> and one time, like the the demeanor, you go to different countries and there's a different demeanor about people. You yeah. know, I think that for a lot of uh, North Americans, we can be a little bit aggressive. Okay. okay. We could definitely be a little bit aggressive compared to more laid back Latin Americans, right? And so sometimes I would feel like, especially when I didn't know no Spanish, like my husband would be handling everything. And then some, some a woman would be talking to him like, duh, 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 duh. like she like, felt like to me, like she had an attitude. Okay. Uh-huh. And so one day I got pissed off because I thought this woman was giving my husband a hard time or a, a cold shoulder or something. I thought to myself, she just treating us like this because we black. So I said, I said, what she say? And he said, Cheyenne, please. She's trying to help us. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I had to stop defaulting yes. to it's a race thing. Yeah. And, and 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 choose to open my mind up that it might be something else. It might yeah. be her having a bad day. It might be her feeling intimidated because she don't really understand, you know, the English that words that is coming out of your mouth. Or it could be a whole lot of other things. But just not to default to racism. Yeah, that's always, that's a good measure. I mean, that's a good way to approach things. Yeah, you are, you are going to find, like people will immediately know that you're American. I don't know. I don't know that there's anywhere I've been where they don't automatically start speaking English to me and assume I'm, I'm American. And that does come with some privilege. And that privilege can usually out like outshine mm-hmm. any right. the racism that they mm-hmm. yeah. be uh uh-huh, the anti-blackness right mm-hmm. so it's probably a good approach to it to just say it's probably not racist right yeah. <laughs> but in Panama, it's not the case stephanie in panama everybody thinks i'm panamanian oh do they we, oh yeah we we look like panamanians i mean i don't yeah. i got you so you know i was in panama i did know everybody looked like me yes but, so I feel like still I didn't now maybe it's because I didn't do too much. When you I didn't, open your mouth, when you open your mouth, because typically I'm approached in Spanish. 
Okay. But nobody comes up to me unless they hear me speak. Nobody will come up to me and speak English because they would assume I was Panamanian. Um, Okay. So there's a lot of, because you know, there's this really, really, really big West Indian, um, West Mm -hmm. Indian population here. And so I say for the most part, we're mistaken. And that's one of the things we like about it. Um, But once you open your mouth, they know. (laughs) And, and, And even with that, I have found myself in places and at tables that I would have never been welcome to in the United States. Absolutely. And I'm not kidding myself. It's it's not that I'm just so gorgeous or wonderful or anything like that. But it it's a, there, there is there is a profit attached to me at this point. Right. There is a, a good reason to do business with me. And I, I, I'm, mad. I'm not mad at it. You know what I mean? I mean, uh, uh, open the door and let me decide which ones I want to walk through. It's right. a whole different kind of life for me. That's right. It's That's a whole right. different kind of life. I was just going to say the thing that is surprising to a lot of people is classism exists in the United States. We know that. But when you go to Latin America, that's when you are you are confronted with classism in in your face Mm -hmm. Uh, because people with money in Latin America have no problem mistreating the the service providers in their life. That's a thing that you'll see in in, that's a thing that is um, surprising. Mm -hmm. You're right. Uh, in, in the U.S., we at least pretend not to be people. Most people will pretend not to be classist. In Latin America, they don't do that at all. Yeah, but then you have then you have uh, expats that come here and treat people uh, in that same way. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the other thing about people about black people moving to these international spaces is gentrification. Yeah, and it's a reality. I mean, yeah. it's it's a reality. It's it's happening. It's gonna happen. And I have just gotten to the point where we we have some opportunities to build, I mean, areas that are like for us, you know, as a group. Yeah. And um, there's a few opportunities that did that just were not good for me. And okay. if there's there's a few things that that happen, if we have to move people out of their homes to move into this development, I don't want no part of it. Um, if we can have, you know, any say so with regard to, um, um, equitable, um, employment for people of color, um, on some of the projects that we do, that's kind of a a deal breaker. It's, it's not attractive to me either, but as far as us buying this land and buying, um, places, we're late to the game. We're very um, late to the game when it comes to investing international and, you know, other people have been here and bought up the stuff that we're paying top dollar for today because yeah. they told us not to come. And we was over there in the U S just thinking what nothing better else in the world and everything mm-hmm. like that. Mm-hmm. So what I do is I focus a lot on the community here. And while we're here, we need to Panama to me is very generous and while we're here, we need to make sure that we're giving back. Yes. And that is just always my focus. Yes. Yes. Um, I got to meet a woman in the airport who had who was flying back from uh-huh. one of your tours. Uh-huh. And she could not talk enough about how it blew away her expectations. Right. Um, because she, you know, Black women in particular are very sensitive to going to a place mm-hmm. and doing like poverty tourism you know, like, and, and, or just sucking out the resources or using the people or whatever. And she just could not say enough good words Um, about how wonderful the experience was and how wonderfully you um, helped show them Panama without it being like, Oh, look at the poor people. Look at this. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Exactly. We come here and I, I do my tours. I have such a big cultural component to them. Because we need to come here with a healthy respect Mm -hmm. for the Afro community. And I just often think to myself, what if people did that in the United States? People come to the United States. These foreigners come to the United States and they're expecting us to be somebody, baby mama. They're expecting (laughs) us to wear our pants down to our, to our, um, our knees. And they're, they're, they're seeing all these stereotypes that uh-huh. the media allows for them to see, but nobody's talking about the fact that we built that damn nation. Mm-hmm. Nobody is talking about it, you That's know? Right. And so when you come here and you come on my tour, you will leave with the healthy respect 
for what they, the, listen, Black people built this Panama Canal. Forget what you heard. Uh-huh. Okay. Black people, other people couldn't do it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, so we definitely delve into that as well. But um, this has been an amazing conversation. I have to get ready to go. You got to have me on your show sometime. Shameless okay. plug. Okay. I don't okay. care. <laughs> I'll, we'll do it. We'll do it. Yes. But let yeah. me ask you this. So I'm glad that we had a chance to talk about the house sitting. Um, for those of you who want to learn more about Stephanie um, Perry, what do you call what do you call your business in? It's the vacay. Vacarious is my Vicarious. business. Vacarious. I love that. Vacarious. You can find her um, everywhere. But also, I just wanted you to speak briefly about this Exodus Summit that you do annually. Mm-hmm. It just seems like it has really, really taken off. And you and Rashida are doing such an excellent job with that. Yes, thank you so much. Career Break Coach Rashida Dow and I created Exodus Summit um, as a virtual event for Black women who wanted to start working on their plan for their sabbatical or their move abroad or their nomad life. It's become more than just an annual event. Our community is more than 14,000 people strong, 14,000 Black women strong. Yeah, it's become more than that. It's become a it's definitely not a cult. I want to say that. <laughs> <laughs> definitely not a cult. It's become a community of women, communities of women all over the world. Women from the Exodus Summit Squad get together all over the world at any time and uh, get to grow and uh, be in community with each other. Uh, we have a YouTube channel called Exodus Summit. We have a Facebook community called Exodus Summit. So if you're a Black woman who is like, this sounds interesting, I want to do it. I want to move abroad. I want to take a career break. Or if you're like, it sounds interesting, I don't think it's possible, join us. Yeah. Okay, yeah. <laughs> you'll get closer and closer and closer. It's empowering. And it's empowering. And again, I just want to thank um, you and Rashida for doing that because that piece right there too, like almost everybody I know has has played some role or engaged with the Exodus Summit in some way that they haven't actually, you know, gone or partaken of the conference itself. They're on the, um, they're on the, um, the page, they're following you, they're following Rashida and this is what they need to see. This is what they, this is what they need to see. It's very empowering. And I thank you so much, um, for doing that in, in parting. And so you have it every October. Is it every October? Are you going to change that every October? It it should stick to October. Yeah. And and one thing I have to say, um, I was, cause I really don't get a chance enough. I don't get a lot of time to watch stuff. Yeah. Um, and it, I, I hate that sometimes because right, people have your life, I, I don't I got that soft I'm looking for that soft life now. But uh, <laughs> I love what I'm doing. I absolutely love what I'm doing. I just need a little bit more time in my day. But listen, I love, I love, love what I'm doing. But I watched um one of the episodes because I had I had a some kind of a, a membership last year as well. I mean the 2022. And you were talking about your YouTube. Mm-hmm. And that blew me away. Right. That just blew me away. Yeah. So YouTube has uh, has given you yet enough opportunity to earn. That's right. YouTube is the only platform out there that does a really good job of bringing you new subscribers, right? New viewers, your itself. You don't have to go out and find everybody. If you have for your, you know this for your podcast for every listener, you have to find those listeners. Mm-hmm. YouTube. If you can get some, get the right data to the algorithm, YouTube will find people to watch your videos. So that's the thing that I love about YouTube. That in partner partnership with YouTube is the best plat- p- platform right now at paying you, right? You Once showed you us get. your back office. That's right. I said, <laughs> this girl is for real. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I love it. I got, I need, I need to be in a pool, in a house with a pool at all times. So I need, I need my money. Yeah. YouTube is the best at that as well. Um, and so it's a wonderful platform. So I get to share, I get to, sh- we, Charlotte and I both, right. When we go places, people know who we are and they thank us and say in our faces, you changed my life yes. for me it's because I talk my talk on YouTube. I think that if you have something to share with somebody, it doesn't have to be with the world. My must, my message is not for the world. Mine is for Black exactly. women and for Black women who are already interested, right? Yeah. Uh, if you have something to share, I think you should be on YouTube. 
It is a place where you can create community, even though you think it's just one direction. You're just talking to a camera. Mm -hmm. You can grow a community on YouTube and you can really change people's lives on YouTube and be compensated for it because yeah. this is- That's the this, part I don't want to get to. This <laughs> is work, right? Yeah, we need to be paid for it. It yeah. is. If that, do you do consultations as well or- I do. I do. Okay. Yes. I mean, yeah, I do a challenge every other month, uh, the YouTube success challenge at vicarious.com slash challenge. You can get on the wait list for that. Uh -huh. uh, so I do a challenge for people. And then I do one-on-one -on -one calls on my website, vicarious.com. So I do one-on-one -on -one and I do group challenges. Women love to be in a challenge because they get to meet other, other YouTubers. Other, that's YouTube. awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. We're constantly proving reality TV wrong. Um, sisters, you know what I'm saying? That's it's right. like we don't That's we don't right. throw drinks in each other's face. You know, we no. we we for the, the most part we're here for each other. And one more thing I wanted to mention: you all take up um, a donation to help um, a, a woman go on a sabbatical. That's right. My community, the Vacarians, uh, have raised forty thousand dollars to date to send Black women on sabbatical. We gave an artist from New Orleans named Maisha Francis twenty five thousand uh, dollars in January of twenty twenty three. Maisha took that money, went to Rwanda for a year, lived her art artist life, right? Made art, taught art, uh, connected with Rwandan artists. Uh, now we're raising money for Alicia Renice, who is a musician and a musical artist, among other things. Uh, yeah. We've sent women on. Uh, we sent a woman to a retreat. We sent a woman on. Uh, we've done some other things, gave money to some other business owners. But yeah, we're over $40,000 to date for Black women to take a sabbatical. That's how serious we are about it. How serious how, we are. How do we, how do we contribute to that? I mean, do you have to be a member of the vicarious group, the vicarious group? or You're all a member. Okay, so okay. <laughs> my, I believe it is vicarious.com slash sabbatical fund okay so if they go to vacarious.com they yes. can look for it there you'll see the sabbatical fund link that's right that's I right love yeah. it. you know yeah. that's that's what you call you know that that that's what you call faith in action that's you right know, you're making you're making a difference and you know and to and to come back you know maybe even years later Stephanie, and to talk to these women about how that changed their lives. Like, have you had them, some of them back on, on the show to no. talk about that? You no, got to be, where are you now? I, I need to, I need to, we need to. Uh, no, I'm just like, here, take the money, to live. Right. <laughs> take wow. the money and live. But we need to, we need to, because that, that you do something, you do have to show things for people to know that it's real, that it's legit. Yeah. So we, yeah. we do need to do it. But yeah, no, uh, one day people just started giving me money in Super Chat, right? Yes. And, and then somebody else mentioned something and I was like, well, let's give this to her. And that's how it started. And the community was like, say less, right? Yes. Here, have some money, have some more money and some more money. So it's their thing. I get to be the um, facilitator. Sure. Yes. Facilitator is the right word. That's right. I get to be the facilitator of this whole strong community, this community of black women coming together and, and wow. giving, giving to each other. I'm so proud of you. It's so wonderful to see you doing what you're doing. And I'm so grateful for you to um, take the time out to spend with me today. I can't wait to get this out there. <laughs> Before I let you go, are there any final parting words you'd like to leave with our get with our audience? For the audience, uh, what I want to say is sometimes something like this can seem so out of reach for you, mm -hmm. a move abroad or moving, bopping around as a nomad or even a career break. It can seem really out of reach, but it also seemed out of reach for almost every person who's already done it. Mm -hmm. Figure out your needs, address your needs one at a time until you are on the other side of it. Mm. There's nobody who's more deserving. We're, Charlotte and I don't get to live abroad because we're more deserving than you, right? right? We get to live abroad because we address the needs one at a time. We took the steps it, we needed to take to be able to live out the life that we want to live. And you can do it too. You don't have to, it's not too late for you. It's not too early for you. It's the right time. 
And for you, Charlotte, thank you so much. So I really, listen, women love, love, love you. Black women everywhere I go, you're the name they're saying to me. Do you know Charlotte Black, the Charlotte Banner? Do you know Pen, right? So you're the name that they're saying to me. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing out loud because you could just as well be like, oh, me and my husband, we're chilling, right? Yes, yes. None of y'all's business. None of y'all's business how how amazing Panama is. None of y'all's business is awesome. Pensionado visa and yes. the benefits and the discounts and all it right. Yes, but you could so easily so have been well, like, I got mine. You. But thank you so much for sharing it out there. There are women and families whose lives are will never be the same. Yes. Uh, you don't know the reach that you have. So oh, thank you so much for, you. for out loud living yeah. out loud. I appreciate you. Okay, my love. Thank you for being on the show. I'll talk to you soon. And there you have it. Y'all, you know what? She is even more amazing than I thought she was. And she said something that I really, really, really want us to take heed to. And she said one at a time. The things that you want to do, just do them one at a time. That's all you got to do. Do it one at a time. Don't allow yourself to be overwhelmed with all of these things, but follow her everywhere. I will, you know, leave her links and um, uh, I've really enjoyed the conversation with her. Uh, I really, really, really did. And, but when she said that one time, that thing really resonated with me because I know when you listen to me and her talk, you think, oh my God, they've done all of these things. And, you know, could I do these things? Of course you can, of course you can, but take your steps. Do it one at a time. And as long as you're doing something towards things that you want, the things that you want to find out about yourself in life. That's why I asked her, like, you know, what did you learn about yourself? Because you will learn about yourself um, doing these kinds of, um, you know, taking taking the chances. So listen here, I'm going to have to go ahead and get on out of here. But I wanted to tell you that our February and March tours are sold out, okay? Uh, but we still have April and throughout the re- rest of the year, you know, visit our new link for our tours and book your tour today. Let me know if you have any um, questions. And also, um, one of Stephanie's favorite songs from the 70s or 80s happens to be a song from 89 called Spread My Ring Wings by Truth. So we're going to um, leave you with that. Um, as always, I want to thank my main man, Daryl Spears at Elite Conversations uh, Podcast Media for producing my uh, podcast and radio show for me. Black Sit Radio, I always want to give it up for um, Devin and Riley for their vision and for just giving us a voice in the world. Listen, follow me everywhere. Keep up. We got great things coming. Um, follow me at Black Expats in Panama and One more thing before I go. I love you. I love you. I love you. And there is just nothing you can do about it. (laughs) See you next time. There was once a day that I would pray for you I'd go and misbehave just so you'd notice too Sneaking looks up and down from across the room Damn, what a hell of a view I feel good, you look 